Excellent. Well, good evening. I believe we are live. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. And first of all, thank you very much to our two distinguished speakers, Professor Seleshek Borishevich and Professor Karol Shikora, who both of whom need no introduction and who for us, it's a real pleasure to host them um, tonight, albeit via the online uh, mode of the meeting that has been become so popular and, and widespread in the last three months or over three months now. Uh, but for Polish City Club, it is a real pleasure to, to host both of you gentlemen tonight. Um, just a word of introduction for myself. My name is Rafał Libera. I'm the president, the current president of Polish City Club, an association of uh, Poles and people of Polish origin working not only in the city, but also all over London, and not only in financial services, but also in the NHS, in different industries, in different professions, as well as entrepreneurs. And with me tonight, we have Łukasz Rzeczkowski, who's my fellow board member at uh, Polish City Club. Would you like to say hello, Łukasz? Uh, good evening. Okay. Excellent. And also, I would like to thank the economic section of the Polish Embassy in London, our partner for tonight's debate, uh, who also helped us putting, to put this um, event together. So thank you again. Uh, as I said, our speakers need uh, no introduction. Um, maybe I'll just say a few words. Professor Seleshek Borishevich, uh, distinguished uh, a very distinguished career at the Medical Research Council uh, of the UK at, as Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University and in many other professions as well as or institutions and currently at Cancer Research UK as the chairman of that uh, very distinguished institution. And Professor Kao Shikora, uh, who's now has been dubbed Professor Positive in Science Media uh, in, in light of his uh, well, very successful Twitter career uh, and, 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 and on, on, in light of the pandemic. But beyond that, uh, also the former director of the cancer uh, program at WHO, uh, currently as a medical director at uh, Ruda for Health, as well as the dean of the Buckingham University Medical School. So with that, I again would like to welcome everyone both people who are uh, have you participants who have joined us uh, via zoom as well as those who are listening to us on youtube uh, one uh, housekeeping rule before i hand over to professor shikar who would like to say a few opening remarks there is a q a, a uh, function at the bottom of the screen uh, please uh, you can by all means engage with our speakers tonight by posting your question over there. Uh, what we would like to just say is uh, be brief uh, and, and ask a question uh, that uh, pertains to the this, uh, topic discussed today. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will, well, I'm sure we'll get lots of questions, but we'll um, try to answer as many of those as possible as we go along. There is also a poll that I, as our conversation goes on, I will launch that will give us at least within this uh, uh, um, group an interesting answer. All, all the poll uh, answers are anonymous. So we hope you can you participate and answer our question that we will pose to you tonight. And with that, Professor Karo Shikora, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to join uh, the PCC this evening. You know, my father was Polish, came over during the war as a captain in the Polish army. That's my connection to Poland. I know a lot of you have a Polish connection tonight. Let's just look at Poland and the UK and what's happened with COVID. Amazingly, Poland has done really, really well. If we look at the data from Worldometer, St. John, uh, from Johns Hopkins, curated by the WHO and presented every day, very accurate data. Poland, 38 million population, Britain, 66 million. So Poland's about two thirds the population base of the UK. We look at the number of cases, um, 35,000 new patients with COVID in Poland, 313,000 in the UK. We look at the deaths, 1,500 in Poland, 44,000 here in the UK. 
okay, there are differences in how you collect that data, but there does seem to be fundamental differences across the world in the incidence and the mortality of COVID. Some of it's the way the data is collected, but some of it's for real. And we're going to have to understand that for future pandemics. And I know Les may want to say something about that. The most bizarre thing to me as a doctor is that I've been a consultant for 40 years and I've been qualified for nearly 50 years now. Not quite, I'm not that old yet. But when we look at it, I've never seen a disease with such a diverse clinical spectrum. So at one end, you've got people dying in a critical care unit with a lack of oxygen because of the inability to get across the lung, uh, across the lung because of inflammatory change in the little air sacs at the end of the lung, the alveoli. And at the other end, 50% of the people that are infected with the same virus have no symptoms whatsoever. There's no reason, and almost certainly these infection numbers, both in Poland and here, are, are an understatement of what people that have been infected. Why? Because if you don't have any symptoms, why would you ever go and get a test? So a lot of the people have not been tested, and if they've had no symptoms, they won't be counted. So understanding this diversity of human response to the same vector, the same virus, is really complex. And when you look at pandemics in the past, and we make a lot of analogy to Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, to the bubonic plagues. You know, my old Cambridge college, Corpus Christi, was built by the city guilds when the plague came to an end. It was a celebration of the Catholic guild in Cambridge to build a new college, Corpus Christi, simply uh, because they wanted to celebrate the end. How did they know the plague came to the end? And that is the problem we've got now. Getting into lockdown is an easy political decision. You take all the data and you say, let's do it. The strictness of that lockdown varies enormously around the world and to a certain extent against, uh, uh, um, amongst subpopulations here. So young people tend not to bother so much. They're much braver and going out and about having picnics right the way through all this. Uh, whereas in other countries, um, UAE, for example, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, very strict control and almost military exercise to control people uh, and keep them indoors a lot longer than we have been here. So moving forward, getting out of a pandemic has always been the big problem. And the usual things of testing, tracing, and, and isolating people that are either positive or living with positive people is the key. You know, I learned quite a lot over the last three months by reading the old books on infection. Um, the, the word quarantine is fascinating. It comes from Venice. It comes from the 14th century, the same period that my old college was built. And it means 40 days, quaranta giorni. And that was the time the boats had to lay at anchor outside the harbor to make sure they didn't have plague on board and a sanitary inspector would go on and check everybody on the boat to see if they had the signs of bubonic plague. And if they were okay, the boat could come into harbor. And public health is using quarantine very much as a way of handling uh, coronavirus. And it has to do somehow, it has to do all these things. In a modern world, it's different. Now, the big question for how this is going to end depends on whether there's going to be a second wave or not. That's clear. The epidemiologists are very gloomy and they say they will and the NHS has to work towards that advice and September, October is the time for the second wave, which then comes into uh, winter and winter pressures, which is the traditional thing we see in Britain of older people with chest infections, lack of capacity, cancelling operations and so on. Uh, I don't think that'll happen. My personal belief is there'll be no second wave. What we'll see is exactly what we're seeing in Leicester. It's a continuation of the first wave locally because of a failure to get proper lockdown. And therefore you get a little bubble. If it's controlled, then it will go away again. Uh, and it'll be all around the world, the same sort of thing. Beijing handled very impeccably uh, on, on the 10th of June. Uh, in a market, in a vegetable market outside in the suburbs of Beijing. And again, all gone, handled. 
uh, the same with Gutterslow in West Germany on the, on the Dutch border, an abattoir, a lot of migrant workers, very bad working conditions and domestic conditions for them, crowding, uh, deprived people really being paid to go to work, whether ill or not. You didn't get paid if you didn't pitch up. So these are powerful incentives to make people carry on as though nothing's happening. So we're likely to see that continuing. So I'm more a believer in that than the second wave. But there are lots of puzzles around the world. Why is the United States so badly affected? This is the land with, that spends $1.9 trillion on healthcare, the land of the free, and yet it's profoundly affected by it. And of course, it caught in politics as indeed in every country other than dictatorships, where the dictator says what he wants done, and it's nearly always men rather than women that are dictators. Uh, and, and, and you look at other countries where the pandemic has been handled impeccably. I think information is the key. And I think you can ban the countries by how well they've done it. And I've seen an analysis only yesterday, uh, a complex an analysis of how well countries have handled the pandemic. And to me, the, you can't control how it's going to, the, the, the host is going to react to the pathogen and how the virus is going to behave. But you can control the information you give the people in the country. And certain countries have done really well. And to pick two, New Zealand and Belgium. Uh, it's not that their death rate's been particularly low, although New Zealand has, but it's just the way in which the information was given with a timetable to get out of lockdown. We haven't really had that. We've had a sort of make it up as you go type way out. And now Leicester's caught people by unawares, and maybe there'll be some other towns that will have to do this. And again, it wasn't planned for. And the information was almost kept secret. So we've now got to put everything on the open. I mean, it's like my, I'm an oncologist. It's like my cancer patients. They know everything. They know more than me. They know about clinical trials that I don't know about because they find them. They're more interested than me in their specific situation. And uh, in, when, it, when it all started, the great information explosion, I'd run to the nurse's computer outside the clinic and look things up away so they couldn't see that I didn't know. I don't pretend to do that anymore. I just sit in front of them and discuss uh, the trial they're interested in. So I think as we go through this journey of COVID, that's all new to us, it's all new to everybody here, the politicians, the scientists, the physicians, and so on, we'll see how it evolves. And uh, I think there may be some bright surprises on the way. The last thing I'll just say, the vaccine, uh, a lot of efforts, huge money being invested in it, millions of dollars, billions of dollars, very competitive, big pharma piling in. Uh, Will it work? Will it come in time? You know, it's surprising that I would say, I hope it doesn't. I hope we've sorted this out well before we have an effective vaccine. Sure, we'll get a vaccine. There are 120 projects going on and one of them will work. It may not be the obvious ones, uh, but something will work. But will we need it? That's the real question. Is there enough immunity going to be out there by Christmas to avoid the actual need for a vaccine? So that, that's my thoughts so far, a bit jumbled, but I look forward to what my colleague Les has to say. Thank you very much, Professor Shikara. Professor Borishevich, would you, of course, the, the point about vaccine is something that's very, uh, you know, something you, you, you're by far one of the greatest experts in the country on. Would you agree with Professor Shikora that uh, hopefully the problem will be solved before a vaccine is necessary? And if not, then when do you see that vaccine being developed? And on top of that, also some other points addressed by Professor Shikora. If, if you just share with us some of your reflections, that would be very welcome. Okay, well, I'm going to be far more pessimistic than Carol has been. Um, why have, you got, have we got such a problem with coronavirus? And you have to go back to look at the biology of this particular virus. What's the problem here? Uh, most viruses are DNA viruses. Uh, they use deoxyribonucleic acid, the same DNA that we have. And because of that, when it replicates in a cell, they use our cellular proofreading machinery to ensure that they replicate themselves with some true identity from one virus to another. This is an RNA virus. There is only rudimentary proofreading activity. The example I use with medical students 
is if you take a single cell and you infect it with a polio virus, in four hours, you have got 400,000 virus particles released from that single cell. And of those 400,000 particles, only 10 will have the same genome that went in into the, into the virus. That's the rate at which these viruses mutate and hence a real problem for us. Already the virus that was in Wuhan, just in a single spike protein, that's the protein that attaches it to a cell, there are already 18 circulating mutations. The virus in the United States and Britain is very different from the virus that was actually in China in terms of uh, capacity to, to respond to it. Coronaviruses uh, do not surprise me at all about this uh, different uh, phenotype of disease that Carol talked about. Um, this is, dare I say, very typical for most viruses. The vast majority of people have almost no illness at all. You have the extreme severity at one end and an in-between population. The unusual nature of this particular virus is the systemic, the far end, the very severe infection as to how widely that virus is distributed. And this is all something to do with things called CPG islands in particular cell types that enable this virus to replicate particularly well. It's why it replicates in the dog uh, bowel epithelium particularly effectively. It doesn't have a problem why cats and other uh, um, and uh, tigers, lions, lynxes, all of those uh, cat families uh, are, remain susceptible. The big problem with this virus is this virus will have multiple animal reservoirs. So even if it disappears in the human population, it is quite likely there will be a continuing reservoir in uh, the animal population. SARS, when it came about, and MERS, particularly in the Middle East, which is virus of camels, has a very restricted population. So I'm afraid my view is this virus has the capacity to hide in the animal population and come out again, having mutated in that animal population, much akin to where flu is and why flu remains the number one risk factor of a pandemic for a country like the United Kingdom. It hasn't gone away. Um, and those of you who are following news stories will see there's a brand new, rather dangerous strain of flu already being detected in pigs in China, um, waiting to hit us this winter. So a real problem that we actually have. Secondly, the immune response to coronaviruses is transient. It's more akin to the sort of immunity we get to the common cold. You remember, if you get a cold, you'll be immune for about four or five weeks but that's about how long the uh, immunity lasts. We have no idea about the longevity or the effectiveness of the immunity. There's a lot published, I'm very happy to discuss the detail, but the bottom line is we don't know how long and how effective that immunity is. All we're measuring is antibodies to basically a super viral proteins and which of those actually matter, we don't know. And the T cell responses that were published from Cardiff today um, all they are showing is, again, to certain bits of protein from the virus, you're getting a particular T cell response. Whether they're protective or not, we don't know. We can't do the challenge experiments. Um, what we also uh, suspect is the immune response, as in dengue fever, has the capacity to potentially do harm because the very severe end of this infection may well be more of what we would call an immunopathology. That is, the virus triggers a reaction against ourselves in our own immune system. And the inflammation, far from being protective, is actually the cause of many people's demise. Hence why dexamethasone appears to have worked and why it was pretty intuitive that dexamethasone would work in, the, in this setting. It's not a great surprise to anyone in the field that dexamethasone happened to be an effective uh, agent in ameliorating disease. So we have a real problem because we don't even know whether the vaccines will actually produce a, an immunity that's long lasting. We have some expertise because there are group one and group two coronaviruses in animals that uh, do produce immunity. And in fact, you may well be having your dogs and cats uh, often immunized against coronaviruses in those species. So we have some reason to be hopeful, but a huge amount of ignorance as to the specificity and the detail going forward. Um, 
if we therefore look as to what is the likelihood of a second wave, I, my own view is it is almost inevitable there will be. Um, far from uh, when we look at pandemics like the foot and mouth disease that occurs, you remember that in that last foot and mouth outbreak that we had, the scientists predicted very accurately where the, and how it would spread and why you had to call, but they also predicted to within 20 miles where the second outbreak would begin to occur. Uh, and this happens because of mutations and changes in the virus. And also, as you release people from lockdown, you begin to get that spread. So, yes, you can prevent these cluster outbreaks that are coming along. But if the virus hides in another animal and everything goes away, once immunity wanes, it will actually hit the population. To date, only 5% of the population have got any evidence that they've actually been infected. That means 95% is susceptible. So as far as this virus is concerned, this is virgin territory. It's a new virus. Um, and for 95% of us, it still is seen as something that we've never encountered before and therefore very likely to produce disease. So uh, drugs. There's a new proteinase inhibitor that's currently in trial that was uh, published two weeks ago. Uh, remdesivir, if we're going to be able to get any of it, because uh, Donald Trump seems to have taken the whole world supply of remdesivir for the United States. And then we have disease altering drugs and we will have more drugs that will come along. Don't ignore passive immunity. If we make antibodies, and those antibodies are effective. Those of us who are old enough to remember when we used to travel to tropical countries, we used to get a jab of gamma globulin in our backside, um, which protected us against hepatitis A. So it's not going to be of much use probably in overcoming an infection once it's established, but it could become a very important preventative for individuals who are at very high risk. Vaccines, 136 trials uh, at the moment. We've got a big problem looming with vaccines. We haven't got the population to test the vaccine on anymore. You'll notice that the biggest moves for both WARP and the WHO program, they're moving to Brazil because that's the only place at the moment which has got sufficient cases for you to be able to look um, at um, susceptibility. So with 136 trials out of those, we're going to have to make some best guesses as to which ones would work. There are only two in Britain, um, some good, guesses at the moment the Chinese uh, vaccine looks reasonably to have at least in primates better protection than some of the uh, other ones that we've got. We can't do virus challenge experiments, which is how you would normally uh, conduct that study. And while all this is happening, once you induce an immune response and 40% of us have an Im immunity to the virus, another factor comes into play. This virus evolves rapidly, but now we're putting an external evolutionary pressure on the viral genome because some of the virus will be culled because it's actually not able to come out because of the immune response we've generated. So far from herd immunity until it reaches 95% having been infected, 30 to 40% may actually augment the infection for those who have not uh, uh, been uh, immune to it. And then we have the problem of longevity of the immune response um, uh, which we've got to deal with, will one shot be enough? And all of those other studies, where and how those can be conducted and what are the surrogates, we haven't actually got uh, very effective surrogates at the present time. So my view would be a little bit different. I think we're dealing with a virus with a very, with a fantastic capacity to change. We have an immune system that uh, we, know that immunity can be generated, but we have no idea how good or how long it will actually last. Um, but it's the best bet that we've got going forward. Drugs will come along to, uh, against this agent. And I believe that you're not going to see the end of this infection until you have an effective vaccine. So uh, in contrast, Carol, I, I would beg to differ. Uh, I don't see a conclusion to this at all. To track and trace will merely keep clusters down but it won't prevent the widespread nature of a second uh, wave coming. Um, and China and uh, Korea have not yet experienced a second wave. They're still seeing cluster uh, infections. It's when everything dies down. And if you like, the, the uh, virus does a second trip around the world um, that you begin to start seeing that. Having changed, 
the virus from Brazil may well be very different from that in China, and the people in China might well be just as susceptible to the, Brazi to, to the Brazilian virus when it hits there. So a very complex and difficult scenario, but one which we will overcome, uh, that I'm optimistic of. Um, I still would be putting my money on a vaccine as being effective. When will it come along? Don't look to any widespread vaccination program before summer of 2021. So track and trace lockdowns, I'm afraid we're stuck with them and we're stuck with our current distancing and other programs as being the only way that's effectively going to control transmission. Thank you very much. Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. Please go ahead, Wukash. Yeah, for, for two remarks. I really, I mean, you, you addressed actually a lot of our questions that we've prepared, but following on to uh, from, from your both addresses, I guess one question that we may have is if you were now to uh, advise the British government on the, the next steps, you know, what would you advise in terms of, you know, what should be the plan of action that you would, would we would minimize the risk of, of, of that second wave? And, you know, and do you believe that, that, you know, the government's been following the right science in terms of the, because we know there were two school of thought in terms of modeling the, uh, you know, Imperial versus Oxford, uh, sort of advisory. Uh, so I was wondering if you could both elaborate on what would you, you know, what would be your kind of immediate steps as an advisory to the government in terms of, you know, the, how should they see the future uh, of the coronavirus uh, spread, I guess. So maybe, oh, do, do you want to? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we've got a negative professor and a positive professor tonight, <laughs> this is great. Uh, I, I'm negative, uh, sorry, I'm positive simply because if we don't get cancer services going, we're going to have a lot more deaths. There's going to be a wave of cancer death. We are stuck, even now, even though yeah. we're three months in, we're stuck. We're not operating with the biopsy rate for cancer is way below what it should be. And that doesn't mean the cancer is not there. It's going to come. Uh, it's another wave of trouble. So, and numerically, it's huge. I mean, we're talking about 30,000 patients get cancer every month. Um, some of it's trivia, uh, minimal skin cancer, other is more serious. And of course, to sort out the di cancer diagnostics, you've got to screen a lot of people. And not just screening as such, but people with symptoms that need to have CT scans, MR scans, biopsies, and so on to sort them out. So uh, basically, how, how do I think it'll emerge? Well, sorry. I think it will, it, the advice to the government now, I think should be to get services open in the NHS fully and to see how we can do that carefully. And, uh, sorry about that. Uh, how we can move it forward. Uh, the most important thing is to get the NHS going and then to look at ways in which we can get COVID free zones around our hospitals and then work out the way to control the virus simply by the standard public health strategies. I, I, I think what uh, alarmed me most about Les's prediction, and I'm sure they're correct, because I think the same, the vaccine's gonna take longer than we think to get there. And with vaccines, there's no margin of error for safety. If, for example, you shoot up a normal population, including young people, with someone that causes some, something that causes demyelination in, in 0.1% of that population, you're in a disaster zone. Uh, not, not just medical legally, but a disaster zone in terms of the illness you're going to cause, especially if the vaccine is relatively weak at protection because it may be short lived immunity from it. So I think. The vaccine strategy for all sorts of reasons is great to do it, we have to do it, but it may not come when we need it at the right time. Everything hangs on what this virus is going to do. So as I implied before, I, it's, it's rather like a dance. You've got the host and the virus and we're dancing with the virus. From an evolutionary viewpoint, and it's great having this chat with Les, what the virus wants, like every parasite, it wants harmony, it wants to stay with us, it wants to live with us forever. It doesn't want to kill us, it doesn't have any need to kill us, it wants to stay, that's its evolutionary survival. It only lives to reproduce, it has no other existentialist being, it has no soul, it has no journey to make of its own, it's not trying to prove anything. And so 
it will weaken, I believe, to try and do that. And we will strengthen because we've already changed our lifestyle. Whether it's enough, I don't know. But we're interlocked in this dance together. And uh, how we're going to get out of it is going to be a real challenge. I just hope, and maybe this is my positivity in dealing with cancer for the, the last 40 years, is simply that the virus will gradually weaken and disappear. You know, when I look back at 2004 at SARS, uh, it sort of fizzled out. It didn't really surface as a main medical problem in Britain. I mean, we didn't rearrange our hospital services for yep. SARS, uh, which we have done for this. So this is only a little coronavirus, for goodness sake. It's, it's wrongly named. It really should be CoV-3 because there was MERS, which is different from CoV-1, which was SARS. But anyway, that's what happens. So if, if you believe it's just the, the younger sister of the two bad ones, the SARS and MERS, then it should follow the path of that. But, uh, you know, Les is going through a, a much more negative scenario. I think both are valid and it may be somewhere in the middle, but uh, we have to prepare for the worst and just hope for the best, I guess. That would be my strategy in this. But there's lots of fine points as well about herd immunity, which is a bad word in political circles at the moment, I guess. So, but a real phenomenon nonetheless. Exactly. Um, the, I think, Carol, what, what you're uh, implying is absolutely right. We've got to get the NHS back on track. That, that, that has got to happen. I think the issue with corona, this particular coronavirus, and, and the, 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 the crunch point is how big is the reservoir outside the human species going to be? Yeah. Because if, like flu, it can begin to start changing in alternative species. It emerges and re-emerges, and that's when you get the secondary waves. So that is something that's not talked about very much. There's a bit of work being done on that, um, but unlike SARS and MERS, it doesn't have the restricted uh, capacity. It seems to have a broader potential of spread. That's right. the reason for, for, for my uh, negativity towards it. Um, will uh, the, the uh, issues for me in terms of controlling the epidemic itself, track and trace is absolutely critical. What's unacceptable is any hour, time after 48 hours that you should not know the result of your test. That is the single biggest failing at the present time from my perspective. Um, track and trace works and can work effectively. If you do the sums, basically, if you get symptoms, you can transmit it. It's usually five days of incubation. So if you can get to the person before they start spreading it in that window of about 36 hours before they will start shedding it, i.e. you've got to hit them in the first three days. Contact tracing after five, seven, eight days. I mean, come on, uh, it, it, it doesn't work. Why all the gizmos? Uh, track and trace by humans, uh, as has been shown in Korea, as has been shown in Germany, works very effectively. And even today, you have all of these people saying, oh, we've been recruited in call centers and we're sitting around doing nothing. Well, guess what? Because the professional track and tracers are able to do it five to 10 times faster because they know precisely what's going on. So very important, we have the backup but I'm not surprised that much of it is still being done within that public health domain. So track and trace remains our major um, area. The question is going to be how firmly you're prepared to enforce it. Yeah, um, and it, I think the it, other uh, thing- This is... has been very much what you've been saying, Carol, it's a difference between cultures uh, that causes this, this particular problem. You can lock down China just now because of a single market, they locked down 400,000 people. And believe me, in China, if they lock down 400,000 people, they will lock down 400,000 people and nobody will be allowed to move uh, out of their uh, apartments. You can't do that because we have a free democracy. We will have Black Lives Matters demonstrations because people feel this, this really does matter. And as you're more trans, uh, you're very transparent about this illness, people are making their own judgment calls. And I'm afraid that's where this virus thrives. It's a, a rapidly transmitted uh, agent. The various models that have been tested, is there any consistency? Well, if you look at the Royal Society group th that have taken together all the modelers, there are so many models around at the moment, it really doesn't work. Both Oxford and Imperial have made mistakes in terms of their monitoring. 
the crassest was from Oxford, the claim that 60% of the population was already infected. You remember in the early days, paper came out, well, that's rubbish. Um, I just wish people would withdraw these papers once the data shows it's 5%. Their calculation's completely wrong. And they were trying to rubbish the imperial data at that time with that data. Uh, sorry, they're wrong, imperial was right. Imperial got it wrong in terms of some of the uh, models that they were using, and particularly the lockdown and the delay to the lockdown. That'll be quite an investigation uh, as to how far that was uh, because we're tracking the wrong area. And we were tracking things that would behave like influenza. This does not behave like influenza. Right. It behaves. In influenza, you have some rudimentary immunity in the community. You have no immunity in the community to this particular coronavirus. So there is no natural protection out there. It's, uh, it really is virgin territory. So uh, yes, there are many models, but they're now all being looked at. They're all being used um, um, and studied and SAGE will have a view and a perspective. And so I'm sure they are getting good uh, reviews. What will be key for us at the end of the day to prevent and particularly in preparedness for a second is to have a completely politically independent review of lessons learned. By that, I mean, it cannot be a House of Lords investigation or a select committee investigation or anything that has got anything to do either with government, with any, either of the houses of parliament. I personally believe you're going to need something like a royal commission that is going to look at all aspects and have access to all of the information that, that, uh, that is available. And that will be important that we conduct that sometime later this year uh, to, to begin to uh, make sure that we're adequately prepared. So those are, I hope, are some of the answers to the questions you posed, Walker. Thank you very much, Professor. Just a quick question from me, and that addresses the point that Professor Borisevich made. And actually, that's also a question we got in from our uh, member from all the way from California dialing in, Cesare Pietraszek. And the question is whether with each mutation, the virus always becomes more virulent, virulent or does it actually can become more benign? And that, that could be a positive. Carol is, is absolutely right that most viruses, the natural evolutionary trend of viruses is not to kill the host. Killing the host is a dead end for the virus. That, that's of no value in evolutionary terms at all. So over decades, a virus will become uh, less virulent. The trouble is we cannot expect this to become less virulent over a very short period of time, mm. largely because there is such a 95% of the UK population is still susceptible. So it doesn't need to change its behavior or to mutate away from that. That will gradually emerge as there is an immune selective pressure um, uh, that appears uh, on the virus. So it does not follow that it will necessarily become more virulent, um, but it could do. Um, it's, you know, we had the swine flu in um, 2008. Most people, sort of thought, oh God, we spent millions uh, to try and prevent that. Well, most people don't realize we were four mutations away from the equivalent of a 1918 pandemic in 2008. Um, people just do not realize how close, the, uh, how, how close we came to something that was really quite uh, extraordinarily and, and quite an important pandemic. So it's not to scaremonger people, but these things often do uh, hang like a thread and preparedness is actually what really matters. And tragically, I think the difference here in many countries is gonna be the scale of preparedness that we actually had to be able to deal with the pandemic when it hit us. Um, when you're operating an NHS at 95, 96% efficiency with all beds being turned over quickly, you've got no spare capacity. Germany had spare capacity, Korea had spare capacity, um, uh, and we're able to, to use that capacity very, very quickly. So again, that's a question, I think, for lessons learned as we go uh, later this year. Thank, thank you very much. I just wanted, uh, because that was an issue mentioned by Professor Borisiewicz, T cell immunity, and I, referred at the beginning to uh, Professor Karo Shikora's um, Twitter account, where you also uh, have been talking and, and sharing with your with followers uh, how T-cell immunity could play a role in uh, containing uh, the virus. 
Um, would you like to um, respond to what Professor Bojshevich says, or, or in you know, from our point of view, what should we know about T cell immunity that could really inform the response and the success of the containment and eradication of the virus? So what we need are better ways of measuring. You've already heard about measuring the virus. It's taking five days to get the result of the test. It's it, it's not done locally. It's posted away often. Uh, across the water to Belfast as a big testing uh, lab there. And that causes all sorts of postal headaches. Uh, we are going to get better tests for the virus. Um, we're going to get point of care tests within an hour, uh, with maybe even with saliva testing. And that would be the ultimate. So you can do it very painlessly, a mouthwash, and out it comes. And then you do the point of care. It's not validated yet, but enough people are working on those tests. And that would revolutionize the whole testing business because you could have lots of test stations, every hospital, you could screen everybody coming through the door for a temperature and for a virus test. With the immune function, you know, we tested all our staff with a, a, a validated kit with a lab in London, and it was clear that less than 6.4% of the staff had antibodies. Also, there are all sorts of strange things. There were people that actually lived together, mother and daughter, uh, and drove together to, to work every day, and that one was positive, the daughter was strongly positive to both IgM and IgG, and the mother was negative. Both felt they'd had the virus clinically and they described a perfect scenario for a virus. So there are clearly other things going on. And the most likely is the, the cellular system and the T cell system is the obvious one. And what we've seen just over the last three weeks, four papers now, and I gathered from Les, there was one from Cardiff today. I've not seen yeah, that. Yeah, Karolinska and Cardiff, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but there was one from Karolinska yesterday uh, and in Sweden, and there were several from Singapore coming out, looking at quite profound T cell immunity. Yeah. And it could be, if one's being the optimistic uh, professor here, that many of those patients may have been infected and have immunity. It's not cross-reaction with past coronaviruses, SARS and MERS. It is indeed a, a reaction. And that could increase the number of people from Boris's uh, 5% to something higher than that. Uh, but we just don't know enough. And at the moment, there's no way we can test for T-cell immunity easily. I mean, you can do it, but you, it's, a, it's a significant lab test with a lot of quality issues. So you couldn't just have it in a car park somewhere and get the result in half an hour as you leave. So it's, it, testing is the key to following what's going on. And we have been slow in this country. Uh, and other countries have been much more nimble. And clearly Singapore has been a model. And, you know, the app it, it has all sorts of privacy issues. And uh, in fact, the whole of compulsory isolation is as Les says, and I've said, is something we, we find we'd struggle to do in Britain. Uh, some European countries would be able to do it. I suspect Poland could do it. Uh, but I don't think Britain could do it in any way. There'd be too much societal objection to it, especially in Cambridge, you know. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue to these immune responses. Um, the St. George's data on antibodies basically showed that people who had relatively asymptomatic infection had very little and low levels of antibody and some almost undetectable levels. So just because you've had the antigen test does not mean to say you're necessarily immune. And we don't even know whether that correlates with susceptibility until these people are followed forward. Uh, we also know that the highest levels of antibody occurred in those who are particularly became very ill. And the data from the Karolinska and Cardiff in a joint study at the moment is pointing again to differences in the nature of the T cell response. So big cytot activated cytotoxic T cells are in those people who are very ill. In fact, we don't even know whether it's those very cells that are making those people very ill. That's, that's the, the catch 22. And we have to be very careful about the type of antibody that's induced because the one that always sticks in my mind from vaccines is the respiratory syncytial vaccine that was actually promoted in the United States um, in the 1980s, that produced the wrong type of antibody and in fact produced catastrophic disease in children who would otherwise have had a mild RSV infection. So if you get the wrong immune response, you can also potentiate 
and make the, um, the, uh, the uh, clinical outcome worse. So yes, um, but reliant on T cell responses to be uh, neutralizing to actually prevent you getting an infection is not usually the role of T cells as, as we all know from cancer and, uh, uh, and studies. They mostly are there to clear up the virus once it's actually established. Um, so it, it is something that we've got to really think about. You need the totality of the immune response and it's the antibodies that by and large are going to be the protective uh, to prevent you getting it in the first place. Um, it's good, to, it's very important to get a good T cell response because without that, antibodies don't clear the infection once it's established. So it's, in, this is very simplistic, but in those terms, you need both parts of the immune response to be effective. Thank you. Um, um, Professor Shikora, you mentioned uh, earlier on uh, the, the, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic in terms of, you know, the cancer patients not being screened and obviously sitting at home. Um, what, in your view, would, you know, what sort of changes need to happen in healthcare right now, broadly, uh, to address that um, issues so we can sort of better, we are better equipped in the future to, uh, to, to respond to that challenge of well, whilst we're focusing on COVID, but we are actually failing on any other, other sort of conditions like, uh, like cancer. Uh, basically, Lukash, we've got to get going somehow, and there is a lot of fear. First of all, patients to actually go to the GP. Many people with cancer in the older age groups, they're scared stiff by what they see out there. Some of them are locked up. They feel vulnerable just going out. They certainly want to avoid situations where they don't control their own space in the high street and the supermarket, in a GP surgery. And... Uh, uh, they're not coming forward. And yeah. recently, until the last week or two, many of the diagnostic pathways were closed. So endoscopy was at 10% of its normal level. Now, endoscopy is, is absolutely vital to diagnose uh, colorectal cancer, one of the big four common cancers. So without the pathway being in place, you couldn't get that done. I think imaging is the other thing. That's beginning to open up. Everything's just beginning to open up. And it's a matter of fast tracking people that are likely to have cancer. We know from the statistics that even if you take the, the two week wait program, the NHS's program, which has been around 20 years, I was on the panel introduced it in 2000. And when you look at it, it's a logical thing. If, you can, if a GP can identify someone that's likely to have cancer, they should be seen fast. They should be fast tracked. Um, and so they would be seen in two weeks. And, uh, unfortunately, it's not easy for a GP to do that. And so if you take breast cancer, breast lump, so one in 10 breast lumps will be cancer, but nine, in ten, uh, nine of them won't be. And that's good for the, for the woman with that lump, but it means you've got to get everybody fast track to get them sorted out and, and biopsied and all the rest of it. There's no way of identifying the cancer patient until you've done the very test you can't get done. So it's the diagnostic pathways where all the emphasis has to be now. The treatment pathways, the, the biggest risk of, is what we call upstage uh, migration, the cancer that's stage one localized to an organ becomes stage two or becomes stage three, therefore it has a poorer outcome but also it needs more treatment to optimize that outcome. It needs more chemotherapy, more radiotherapy, and more fancy radiotherapy. And this is all pressure on a system uh, that we know is operating at capacity normally. So how can we speed that up? And one of the ways is to abbreviate without detracting from the courses. And there are some things we can do in cancer not to cut corners, but to abbreviate treatments. And one simple thing that's being done now um, there's a drug that's used in both colorectal and breast cancer called 5 fluorouracil It's given by intravenous injection. It's fairly complex to give. Uh, there's an oral formulation, capecitabine. Can we just make the shift and give everybody capecitabine? I think there's enough data to show it's quite a reasonable transition, certainly for the next six months, unless there's some special reason not to do it. Uh, and so these are the sorts of things the oncology community is doing. At the moment, they're not busy. They're sitting there twiddling their thumbs because the patients aren't flowing through the diagnostic pathways and the surgeons that feed into the cancer centers uh, are not operating at full capacity. So that will start probably uh, next month 
August, September, and then we'll start moving again. I hope so, because the longer you wait, the worse the outcome will be for these patients. So I, I totally agree with where Carol's position is on this. This is exactly what we're trying to say to patients. You've got to go where it's compounded is when people start ignoring chest pains. They start ignoring uh, interventions. So it's not just cancer. It's the person who ignores a sudden weakness in his left hand and it goes away and they've had a, uh, a slight warning uh, uh, stroke. Again, by the time they turn up to, to hospital with a full-blown um, uh, stroke, it, it is uh, almost too late. We've missed the chance. So we're going to see an awful lot about this. And this is the number that we're seeing in these excess deaths that are talked about by the Office of National Statistics. Already, even in the short term, we're seeing excess deaths, almost certainly from people who have not sought medical attention when they genuinely needed that attention. So it's about making the NHS change people's minds and remind them that they are once again open for business. You know, casualty departments have never been quieter than they are at the present time. I know they've always moan about the number of people they have to see and many don't need to be there, but nevertheless, it's an indicator of how far people are avoiding contact with the healthcare uh, system unfortunately, ultimately to the detriment uh, of some. And where we're going to start seeing problems is exactly as Carol is saying, what we're going to be seeing is even a year from now, we're going to be seeing the fact that they are upstage. We're going to start seeing a slowdown in our capacity to reach in that figure that we use at Cancer Research UK of three and four surviving 10 years or more in cancer, where we were nicely on track to get to that sort of number it's going to become more difficult and it will certainly be delayed in the longer term. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I just mentioned I released a poll uh, which 68% uh, of participants have already completed. If you'd like to complete it, please do so. But uh, And then we'll see the final results. But at the moment, and the question in the poll is, since the onset of the COVID pandemic, has the lockdown at any point resulted in you missing or postponing a doctor's appointment, a hospital visit, or a health screening, 60% have said at least once, and out of that, uh, majority more than once. So even in the, our focus group here tonight, we can see that this is having a tangible effect on, on patients. So as the professors have said, if you need to go to a doctor, please do, because it's important not to uh, leave it till later. Maybe just to add uh, sort of here uh, as a, an additional question, would you say the messaging from the government should change in terms of, because obviously the, the, the initial messaging was be a hero, protect the NHS, yeah. uh, you know, stay at home. And obviously that would could mean that people would disregard their uh, symptoms because they wanted to, you know, to, you know, so they're saving others. Would you now say that the, the message from the government should st should change and say protect yourself? you know, be proactive and, and then, you know, try to communicate what, what you're, what no, your problem. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. Where, where I would go is to make the NHS ready to be responsive, as Carol has pointed out, and actually to go back to the messaging, the NHS is there for you. Make sure that you use it as you have been before, because we've created, we can now operate safely. And that's why everything that Carol has said about making sure your safe operation of the NHS is absolutely vital to win people's confidence uh, back so that they will once again um, go back to uh, habits that they had before. And you know, it's switched to a, a virtual service and yeah. that would be good news for trusted doctor because they have yeah. all the software to do it very effectively. Yeah. You would plug, Lukash. But no, there's no doubt, it, it was forced on us. We've talked about it. We just talked for, for, for at least 10 years about how we yeah. could do telephone appointments, nurse-led telephone triage and so on for cancer follow-up. And yet nothing actually happened until three months ago when it suddenly happened. Yeah. And uh, it'll carry on. Uh, and it's the same for general practice. The GP is no longer, you no longer have to go. And, you know, for diagnosing cancer, you'd say, well, surely you have to examine someone. That's not necessarily the case. You could get on the telephone the symptoms. You could organize a colonoscopy. You could organize a, a breast biopsy. You could organize a CT of the chest, certainly a chest X-ray, without actually uh, examining someone. 
And in fact, medical students these days, you know, they don't, their examination skills are a fraction of what Les and my skills were when we were at their stage, because they just go straight to the scans. Yeah, and hopefully they're seeing disease a lot. All the algorithms on their mobile phones trick you out. But, but Carol, hopefully they're seeing disease at a much earlier stage than the kind exactly. of uh, exactly. diseases we were seeing. So thank you very much. I'll end the polling here. So we have the final results. It's 50, 57 percent of people on this call today, of those who voted, have postponed or missed their appointment. So majority have, have had this issue. Um, I wanted just to address Professor Shikora and also Professor Boyshevich, the point uh, that was raised by you, Professor Shikora, regarding the US and the fact that we don't know why the situation is so severe there. And in a, the question, my question actually refers to the point that was raised about postponing procedures, because my question is, is the fact that the US healthcare system is based on a service for a fee model people and, and therefore people do uh, defer going to a hospital and un un until it's really serious because they don't want to pay the uh, deductible uh, premium under insurance or or in fact they might not have insurance results in this current crisis in a situation where the general population on average is much, much more susceptible to this virus because they're immunocompromised as a result of the fact that they haven't, the general health is worse than let's say in the European population. You know, it's a fascinating question. It really is a fascinating, and I, I'm surprised at what happened in the States, especially in affluent parts, California, Miami, and, and, and Florida and so on. And yet it's clearly a problem. Now, you know, the, the problem with US healthcare is that the facilities are fantastic, there's no doubt, and the availability, if you look at any metric, CTs per person, MR scans per person, endoscopy suites per person, are, are just super. Number of doctors, number of nursing staff, it is fantastic, but it's unequally distributed. And even though the Obama uh, regimens improve things in terms of the uninsured, there's a lot of mystery there. Now, in the very best centers, it's fantastic. And I'm sure Les has been over there. I did a fellowship at Stanford in California. It was a wonderful period in my life to see really optimal care for cancer being delivered. Uh, but sadly for this, public health is very poor in the States. They, they have, and of course, civil, civil liberties are, are very high. So you've got this conflict, uh, uh, testing and tracing, is not likely to be popular. And this is a society in which people carry guns, for goodness sake. I mean, it's, this is not a civilized society out there. And I think the problem they have in dealing with this is reflected in the, the class structure uh, and the problems they have in dealing with that. How it ends up there, the figures, I looked at them this morning, every day they seem to get worse. They're more like Brazil than they are Europe. And it's not coming to an end. And that, that's why the curve hasn't turned down in incidents. And, and that is really worrying. And the thought of Americans coming to Europe, they can't do it. We just have to say we can't let you in for the time being until things get better over there. Uh, even with all the testing and antibody tests and all the rest of it, I think we've got to uh, try and work out why it is. I feel so sorry for old Fauci because he's uh, taking it in you know, from an angry president that wants to be re-elected, he's caught in this uh, headlight of the, car, the motor car like a rabbit with all this going on. He's a very experienced uh, immunologist, infectious disease expert, and he's stuck as the, uh, the key man in all this, trying to explain why this has happened uh, in the most powerful country of the world. Uh, it's, it's a bizarre question in a very good one. I wonder what Les would say. Yeah, I think the it is cultural, probably to an extent. the The way in which different communities view the seriousness with which an outbreak, you know, it's very easy to say the real problem is Trump and Bolsonaro, the attitude from the top down uh, towards this infection, particularly in early stages. People forget these are exponential rises; they it rises very, very quickly. 
but you do have an awful lot of circulating virus in different parts of the states. You also have some very poor communities and viruses by and large and epidemics, that's where they really get hold of, uh, uh, catch hold in those communities where you've got overcrowding. So. Uh, it is going to be one of the most interesting uh, areas is going to be the comparative epidemiology when we get down beyond the sort of politics of who came top and the league tables and start looking as to how different communities and countries um, address the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the problem that we actually face. It, it always has been. Um, and viruses are no different. They're diseases of inequality. So wherever you've got stark differences in, in terms of inequality, in California, this is not um, a disease of Hollywood. This is a disease of, uh, of poorer neighborhoods still. It, it, it's the same um, the world over. It's hitting the favelas in, in South America. So it, it, it's something that I think is there, but the, some of the differences are cultural and some of the differences are going to be down to responses. And for me, one of the things that we absolutely must do if we're going to get um, to prevent second waves is to get a global understanding of what went right and what went wrong country by country um, so that this is not the time for uh, macho you know we finish top of the league table it's actually what could every country have done better um, in order to uh, to achieve better outcomes and less damage to the economy because let's not forget damage to economies is going to produce excess deaths, as we all know from the inequalities that will result uh, with rising unemployment and uh, uh, other issues that, as people face economic hardship uh, downstream. So it's a very complex agenda. Um, the importance for me is it's got to be a lessons learned. If it starts being a finger pointing exercise or, you know, find the, the scoundrel who got it all so badly wrong and um, then we're not going to get anywhere out of it, which is why my anxieties for the United Kingdom is it's got to be depoliticized almost entirely in terms of uh, being able to look at this uh, very objectively um, without sort of looking for scapegoats in, uh, in, in the system. People have made mistakes. Um, I think the honest, the best ones will be honest enough to admit, yes, everybody's made mistakes uh, along this way. But that's true of every country as well. Thank you very much. I actually would like to um, raise a question that was asked by our member, Mogajata Shesho, who also works at the NHS. Um, and it goes as follows. Do you think that the current state of the pandem pandemic is an unwanted opportunity to change the way in which we store and share medical data, for example, antibody status, vaccination history? And is it possible to predict now what impact it will have on the insurance industry? That's a very good question. Um, the, uh, the problem is very much going to be back to the same one of uh, how much control do you want of medical data? It, it is there is a public health need to share that data at the present time and it's being done so on an anonymized basis but i've already alluded to the we, we need to know who's had an antibody test done it's an individual thing you can't you've got to be able to track every single individual who's been tested and to look at what outcomes there are and whether there's any susceptibility to infection based on the amount of antibody that you've got or the t-cell response that you've got so it's not going to be enough to have just grouped anonymized data, you're going to need that individual data. So I think it will raise the whole debate about the anonymity of data and how data can actually be, uh, uh, be best used. Will it uh, impact on the insurance industry? This was a debate that happened early on with HIV. Um, and you will recall in the very early days of the HIV epidemic, there was a question on most insurance is not are you HIV infected, is have you had an HIV test? Which was very interesting because anyone who was working in infectious diseases at that time had an HIV test. Um, most clinicians had an HIV test because you needed a baseline to know in case you actually acquired it uh, in the context of your work. So it meant that if you were looking for a mortgage, you had to actually tick the box, yes, I did, which automatically then disqualified you from getting uh, an insurance. And what happened was that there was an agreement between the insurance industry that this would not impact on uh, people's uh, 
um, insu uh, life insurance and other policies um, and was then withdrawn as a question uh, in its entirety. So what impact it'll have on the insurance industry is marginal. Where the insurance industry, I think, are going to be um, stuck in court battles is over susceptibility were the right, uh, you know, the, the abattoirs that Carol talked about quite rightly, you know, how far are those abattoirs actually should be held responsible for having an environment that did not uh, distance people appropriately, um, and therefore were they responsible for the individual's disease, and it's those sort of compensation battles and how far they're covered by insurance uh, is going to be a big part, uh, I suspect, for the insurance uh, debate uh, going forward. Um, usually we find ways around this um, in, um, in relation to the insurance and actuarial data that, that comes through. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Shikar, would you like to yes, add I'm, something? I, I mean, IT has never been the strength of the NHS or indeed the private providers. We've not in this country excelled ourselves. There was a Connecting for Health program 15 years ago, which closed down, having spent an enormous amount of money to try and get electronic uh, medical records. And anyway, it's a national health service. It should be possible in this modern age when you, it, kids can do anything with a smartphone or a computer to actually share records between primary and secondary care, between the emergency room and the diagnostic. What we have seen is an explosion of little systems such as picture archiving uh, in radiology that works superbly but they're local systems, they're local to either the equipment or to uh, that hospital. What we need is a, a national, and it's, it's coming, it's coming but very, very slowly, an electron, a personal electronic medical record which the patient can actually interact with and put uh, patient-related outcome measurements that affects them. It could have tremendous research potential. I mean, the one thing that I see now in this pandemic is NHS 111, the non-urgent call service. It's been fantastically curated and you can see now, you put in four symptoms and the computer uh, NHS digital can get out exactly the sort of pockets we want to see of symptoms. Okay, it's not testing, it's not sophisticated, but looking for shortness of breath, fever, for loss of taste and smell, uh, and, 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 and a dry cough. They seem to be the four things that come up again and again, and you just follow the curves. And where there's a, a, a blip locally, you can see it all matched to a postcode. I mean, it's fantastic data, very, very simple. But because we don't have a complete package of IT for individual patients, we can't totally use that. That will come, I'm sure it will come out of that. But you do have the problem of, of confidentiality and what the data can be used for and whether you will that you trust Google and Apple and the big companies to do that. Um, IBM have their IBM Watson program for looking at cancer specifically. And again, there were lots of questions about confidentiality. I think we're getting used to the fact that everything's held on the computer, you know, where you reapply for your, your driving license, for your uh, you know, road license, it's all automatically on, on a computer. And we got used to that. So I think we are going to have to get used to the computer taking our health data. It's a much safer system than having little bits of paper. You know, at Hammersmith, I'm sure Les remembers, uh, only about 95% of the notes on a good day would pick up, pitch up in the <laughs> the 5% that didn't, what you'd have to do is get the medical student to go and see the patient to present it to you. So you didn't have to be embarrassed by that fact. You had no idea where their cancer was in my case. And you would be examining the wrong bit of the body or to admit you didn't remember where the cancer was and looking for a therapy mark. So, or, or you kept summaries of all, or, uh, copies of all the summaries you wrote. Exactly. The records because you knew you had a file yourself. Well, to, to, to try and work out from the pathology results. Yeah. Computer, exactly. what was going on in the patient. It was, uh, you know, and that, that's happening still around the country. Yeah. Paper notes are dangerous ways, and they're not confidential. If, if you've got a spy wanting to find out what Les's illness is, if he has any illnesses, they can find out by just going to a hospital. There's a lack of security and access to notes everywhere. So I think we're going to have to come to terms with that, like you say, Carol, uh, uh, that uh, we will. Um, and this might accelerate it because the power 
has become very uh, will become very open to individuals the power of being able to do this um, there are questions there for example on covid track and trace is this a way back to uh, a normal economy well uh, even Singapore has only got about 47% uh, uptake, as I understand, of the uh, yeah. app in Singapore. That's nowhere near enough. You've got to hit 75% to make any difference at all. Um, at the moment, I'm a little bit skeptical of all the, uh, the apps because they're dependent on that Bluetooth connectivity. And, you know, the Bluetooth can't tell the distance that you're actually apart if you hold it in your pocket. Um, I've actually tried this uh, from a, a speaker, uh, in my, uh, a Bluetooth speaker that I've got. You put the device in your pocket, the signal becomes uh, you, you, uh, much more attenuated than if you don't. So are you going to always hold the device? So you've got to find new ways of actually using it. And maybe something about some of the more commercial packages, we're just going to have to come to terms with it. I do worry a little about data being held outside the country and subject to legal processes, though, uh, of countries which is not where we're residents. So, for example, if Google and Apple are susceptible to Californian law, I'm therefore not very happy about them holding my data that is not under the protection of the legal system of the country in which I'm resident. Um, and that, that's something that uh, I think many people would have that uh, sort of view where some countries are much laxer in, in terms of uh, protecting the individual versus protecting the corporation. So I think again, all of this, it should be there for debate and, and this is not beyond, this is not rocket science. It isn't something that we can't solve. Excellent. Let me, um, since we addressing, and thank you for, for all the questions that are coming from the audience, I'd like to uh, tie up two questions together. So one is about uh, the future or uh, the, the prospects of public private partnerships and then I think that ties into well into a second question, which is more a bit more detailed regarding the integrative east-west medicine and question whether, I don't know if you have, if you're familiar with it. Um, if you are, the, the question goes as follow that this is already gaining traction at uh, both leading universities and clinics in the US, but also in Europe. And what would be your opinion on it and its relevance for the healthcare system, presumably here in the UK, uh, especially given its strong focus on prevention and strong applicability to degenerative autoimmune or onc oncological diseases, diseases, which seem to become an important aspect at, in, in these times? I'm, I'm going to be uh, fairly open about that. I have little anxiety about any treatment so long it's actually shown to be effective and can be delivered efficiently. Sorry, it's going back to Archie Cochrane's old statement on effectiveness and efficiency. So I have no difficulty with any type of medicine so long as it's prepared to be subject to the quantitative evaluation um, of its effectiveness. Uh, what I am not prepared to uh, support are ineffective or potentially ineffective um, and untested systems uh, being people being exposed to those based on anecdotal data. So I'm sorry in this, I'm completely uh, quantitative in terms of uh, wanting to see direct evidence of benefit. Uh, and those systems have to be subject to the same investigation that conventional pharmaceutical and other treatments have to be. Excellent, thank you. A lot, you. Of, our, a lot of our cancer treatments come from plants. Vin Christian from the yeah. periwinkle was growing outside in my garden. Yeah from the yew tree they may be synthesized now rather than from the plant that's where they were discovered and Fun artemisin for for malaria you know it's yeah, a, it's so no, no problem with it but evidence is there for their eff efficacy yeah, exactly all with it if there's a lovely little chinese shop um, uh, in Marylebone that i passed and one day my curiosity got the better of me i went in there and said what do you have for cancer and the, she gave me these, uh, she showed me this stuff that was for cancer. I said, well, where's the data to show that they improve cancer treatment? And a lot of them are not actually for cancer. They're to improve the symptoms of chemotherapy and so on. That makes sense. But again, you want to see the data and the, that's the problem. It's not data that you can really interpret. And uh, now there are some groups actually researching traditional yes. Chinese remedies as adjuncts to chemotherapy, for example, doing experiments in animals and in cell lines and culture. And 
and, and in clinical trial, and that's very valid. But we need to go back to the first part of the question, which uh, in partnerships, I think the reason that some European countries have been more successful with COVID is first of all, they have more capacity in healthcare than we do in the NHS. And secondly, they do have effective public private partnerships in healthcare going already. Uh, we don't here. There, there is a private system, about 15%, and I'm, I'm resp I've been in both systems, so I've seen both in operation. There's a, an attraction in both. Um, uh, uh, private medicine here is too small. Uh, it has to be a partnership when you do something like cancer. And so we hope that our proton facilities that we've built uh, w will be used by the NHS and are being used in Wales and uh, where you come from, Les, so, uh, in Newport in Wales. So I, I think the, the, the future is about both working together. And I think we've been forced to over COVID and we're going to be more than forced to with the consequences of COVID. Most people have to realise that there is no way of delivering a medication without involvement of the private sector. Yeah. So for me, uh, just like for Carol, there is no debate about this issue. Uh, if you believe private medicine is the devil incarnate, that buy yourself a long spoon, because if you want to transfer benefit from the bench to the bedside, you're going to have to sup with the devil of, of, of yeah. private engagement. So for me, it has to be conducted. It has to be conducted fairly on both sides of the equation. And whether it's a charity like Cancer Research UK or whether it's the NHS, you do need to engage and to make sure that the patients get access to the most effective uh, treatments that, that, that are available at a price that is affordable for, uh, for the taxpayer, um, which again uh, can be achieved uh, if we work together. But you know, public-private uh, investment should, should be seen as an opportunity, not as, uh, as something that, to be really feared all the time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Wukash, would you like to raise any of the issues that... Yeah, I, 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 fascinating remarks. Thank you very much. And I actually wanted, because we started on a sort of positive note uh, at the beginning, and, and I, I, I'm kind of thinking of a question that would kind of wrap things up because we, we are, will be running out of time. So I wanted to draw uh, maybe with a question, you know, what else do you see you know, what other positives do you see coming out of this, uh, this learning, you know, of, of, of handling pan pandemic in the UK, but also internationally? And what do you see the, the effects, what there will be the, those positive effects that would be long lasting uh, for the healthcare uh, sector? Mm. Shall I go first here? Yeah, fine. The, the, the most positive is the use of information technology, I think, everywhere from personal devices such as smartphones through to uh, more sophisticated systems for electronic medical records. The second globally is we need to strengthen the WHO somehow. You know, it's got a lot of stick, it, but it, we do need an international organization. It's got problems. I, I was in it for two years, 20 years ago, and it had problems then, and it's still got the same problem. I know Les knows it well. Uh, there are profound difficulties in it, and it's to do with the, the pr pr problem is you've got 196 countries all wanting a say in it. And, uh, but, you know, they've handled infection in the past really well. This one, it, it's sort of been very messy for a variety of reasons. And again, politics come in with Trump withdrawing his money, whether he really withdraws his money is sort of irrelevant, but uh, he's making the political gesture. I think we've got to get away from politics. We've got to have an international authority that has the, advises governments and it hasn't really advised governments. At the moment, it's, it's worrying about coming out of lockdown too soon but it's not helpful to a government to read that. I mean, it, it wants didactic advice, pragmatic advice on what to do. And the WHO is in the best position to do that. So uh, would agree with both those points. I, I think global collaboration is something that is going to be very important. Data, yeah, I think it's going to be given a lift up as I think the, uh, one of the big areas is going to be people are going to be maybe just a little bit less frightened of information technology uh, because they've seen it um, the, 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 that it is there. 
I think another good thing that will come out of it is maybe more transparency with data to the, the, the public. And I'm a great believer that the more transparent you can be, people deep down do know that if you're honest, um, even when mistakes are being made, at least be honest about what it is and show that you're learning lessons from what's going on. People can be very forgiving. What they don't like, I believe, it is where people are trying to hoodwink them or hide away um, information that is not particularly palatable. So I think that will be important. Another thing that I do see uh, being improved is the fact that we're going to be bringing social care much more closely to the healthcare system. Now, Carol and I, we both know that this has been a bugbear for years and years and years. But if this doesn't show us that the impact of something in the healthcare system is really impacting in the whole social care system, it's a single system. And we've got to start treating it uh, as such, uh, the, the, that it really does uh, matter. And for me, the, the, um, as somebody who's been in infectious disease, maybe we'll just wash our hands a little bit more than we have been at uh, present time. Believe it or not, it's still the most effective way of actually stopping spread of infections. It's, uh, it, it does work. Um, the downsides, uh, I, I'm a little bit concerned about isolationism and uh, how people can get stigmatized even in, in society. So knock on effects to those in mental illness and things. Those are the things I want to be, be wary of, that we could become a much more um, insular society rather than uh, reaching out to, to the wider community and particularly to those who need support uh, from the com community as a whole. So I would worry about isolationism and, and insular, uh, being very insular. I'm worried about countries starting to think much more about benefits to themselves rather than this global uh, approach. No virus is going to worry about the English Channel, believe me, it'll be right across that in no time at all. And if you really want to know how desperate it is we have an effective WHO, there's data which is um, modeling data uh, conducted in the 1990s. It came originally from Roy Anderson and colleagues looking at when would you declare a global pan flu pandemic. And it was a study that was conducted as to how many cases would you need to detect in a country in Southeast Asia from a point outbreak before that you declare a global pandemic. And the answer was for influenza, if you detect 40 cases in Thailand, it is already a global pandemic because you will not stop viruses spreading. So unless we're gonna stop all air travel, which I hope we never do, then we're going to see, uh, uh, we've got to get back to this idea that pathogens will not uh, stop at borders, they will cross borders, and therefore an international response is really needed. And we need to do our best to depoliticize that advice, because uh, unfortunately, at the present time, whether you believe Trump feels that there's too much China influence in the WHO or not, you need somebody uh, that is actually created to be able to prefer that advice. So yeah, those would be the things I hope come out positively. Um, and let's actually be honest about it. If we come through this, there is something about all pandemics. You remember the Black Death? That caused the fall of the Roman Catholic Church, probably with the Reformation that followed fairly closely thereafter when it failed to deliver. The government of Venice collapsed after the uh, in the sense of plague. Most pandemics, the 1980 outbreak had huge impacts. When you have global pandemics, they usually have societal impacts as a consequence. So this will, the question mark, will it be for better or will it be for worse? I hope genuinely hope it'll be for better and a more collaborative spirit between all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I think we've run out of time. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I believe all of us agree, uh, Wukash and all the people that join us tonight, both via Zoom. And hopefully, uh, Professor Shikora, uh, as we were discussing earlier, there will be opportunity to meet and talk in real time before long. But for, for the time being, it's in Zoom. And, and I think by Zoom standards, this was a really, really top class uh, discussion and debate. And I would like to thank everyone who asked their questions. Unfortunately, we were not able to deal and addressed all of them. Uh, we are time constrained here. And you have uh, posted numerous questions. So that, that's fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, engagement from you. Uh, but 
I think we, we ended on a positive or hopeful note and, and that definitely is, is a good thing. And uh, we learned a lot about what caused this virus, what are the underlying um, conditions of, of this particular virus strains, how our system, healthcare system needs to change or react, adapt to the change circumstances and what are the uh, prospects for an actual vaccine uh, uh, being developed and uh, well, saving us in the long term from, from this virus strain. Um, uh, so I think this was a really, really, really uh, interesting, really good conversation. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you, uh, Professor Seleshek Borisiewicz for your contributions. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor Karol Shikora as well for, uh, for a fascin fascinating remarks. And Wukash, I think this, this was a really, really good P Polish City Club event in cooperation with the economic session of the Polish Embassy in London. And that's it. That's all from us. Have a good evening and stay well. And do not delay the health screenings or hospital visits if you need to go. Please. Wash your hands. Wash, yeah. wash your hands. Yeah. Wash your hands. Don't forget. Fantastic. Carol, thank and thank you very much for the earlier conversation. Oh, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thank you, everyone.